A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 216th episode of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. As we proudly completed our 200th episode recently, going down the memory lane, it was back in 2020 when we here at Notebook decided to launch a platform for the educators to connect meaningfully on discussing problems that are facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions. Little did we know that day about this platform growing so, so big, where principals and educators from across the lens and breadth of the country have participated over so many sessions. We thank you all once again for supporting us and would look forward to your gracious presence in all our upcoming episodes. We have discussed extremely vibrant topics here, like digital learning, NAP and assessment, extracurricular topics, like sports and theater, topics like school finance and management, and even about topics like child psychology. Our today's topic is basic first aid and CPR skills. This is one of the most essential elements in the learning space of a child. Let's hear from the experts today. Our first speaker on this topic is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as a deputy headmaster from the illustrious Zone School in Daradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Zone School as housemaster, head of department, Dean of Activities, Dean of Student Welfare, Deputy Headmaster, Second Master, and Acting Headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at the Wellington College, UK in the year 2000. He is also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we here at Notebook are truly privileged to have Mr. Barrett as our senior advisor. Sir, thank you so much for being here today. A very, very good evening and over to you, please. Thank you very much, Gauguri. I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. You yeah. are doing well. And uh, very good evening. And, uh, and also very good evening to the entire Notebook team, Achan, our esteemed panelists and our guests who tuned in. I want to speak a little about first aid in general and then talk about uh, CPR a bit later. As you know, in all schools and residential schools, uh, medical safety and quick response to injuries and accidents is very important because parents entrust the safety of their children to us. And therefore, we have this great responsibility of looking after them. Of course, the chances of something going wrong in a residential school is far greater than in a day school because these kids are with us 24-7 for about nine months of the year. And um, I think um, it is the care that people who are injured get in the first 10 minutes that can sometimes be the difference between life death or serious injury and not so serious injury. And in my time as a teacher, I have seen so many, so many accidents uh, just because there's been no adult around the accident site. If you let children handle it, it becomes a problem. As long as there's an adult around, there is a tendency that things uh, will, will, will take uh, the right course. Uh, glass cuts, acid burns, eye injuries while playing with sticks, hockey injuries, fractures on the field, burns and cuts, uh, insect allergies, bee stings. We had a lot of bee attacks in our school. And sometimes bee, bee stings can, if, if a child is allergic, it can, be, can become fatal. Wounds that need stitches, deep cuts, choking, asthma attacks, nosebleeds, uh, head injuries. We had a head injury when a discus hit a boy. Uh, this, the swimming pool injuries, we had an accident where a boy dived into a shallow end and he broke his back. He was on a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Uh, there are certain students, uh, schools that have lost students to electrocution. Electrocution by playing the electric, electric guitar, mind you. So there is no end uh, to um, the number of problems that can occur. The idea, of course, that you know, uh, just having a trained doctor on the campus is not the only thing. Every teacher has to be vigilant. And every teacher on the spot has to be at least able to take the child to the infirmary or the sick room. Um, the teachers have to judge the danger of a situation. You know, when you're playing cricket at the net, so hockey is going on. We need to have adults there vigilant enough to handle the problem in a very cool manner. Now, most schools have a sick room or a wellness center. They have visiting doctors or an impaneled set of doctors. Uh, but more so, more important is to have the nursing orderlies and uh, nurses who can who can really treat the job 
uh, you know, treat the child immediately. And I think, I believe all schools should make first aid for the staff and the children compulsory. At least CPR and what was, was called the Himalayan maneuver, now it's called airway blockage, blockage uh, removal. Um, uh, and I think these two are very important. The Himalayan is important because for choking, uh, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, technique which you can learn in five minutes. But we had a boy in our school who actually saved a child from dying of choking in the, in the Shatabdi Express. And the parents wrote to the school and, you know, this letter was read out at assembly. So this little boy who was in class 10, who had taken first year classes in school, actually saved a life in reality. So I think, you know, we had the St. John's Ambulance, which is a subsidiary of the Red Cross, uh, doing regular classes. And we had a team of students who were the first aid squad. And nobody ever left the school. No team, no, no, no trekking group. Nobody left the school without at least one to two first aiders, trained first aiders amongst the students with them. And I think staff too have to be put through a regular CPR and Himlik, if not cuts, bruises and other injuries. Um, I think students should know where the stretchers, where the neck braces are located. They should know the telephone numbers of the doctors on the campus or the ambulance driver. Uh, they should know uh, how to carry a person uh, to the sick room. Because if you carry a person wrongly you know, with a neck injury, you might even uh, aggravate the problem. Um, I think also most schools today require oxygen cylinders or at least an oxygen making machine as well as defibrillating machine. At least two de defibrillators on the campus if your school is large. Now CPR in itself refers to cardiac pulmonary resuscitation, which is basically pushing down with two hands on the chest of a person at a certain rate and intensity. Very important to have the certain rate and intensity in order to revive the person. It can never be done on a person who is breathing. And it should never be practiced on a living person. You practice it on dummies. It is only given when there's absolute certainty that the patient is not breathing. And since and only 5% of the world, they say, know how to do it. And yet it's one of the, one of the greatest life-saving techniques. The protocols of CPR keep changing. The current protocol is you have to give 120 compressions in a minute. That means it's a very, it's not easy to do because it tires you out. And that's why it's advisable to have two people kneeling next to the patient so that one person can take over uh, when one is tired. It's, it's a lot of hard pushing down at the rate of 120 per minute. Um, I think the school wellness center is more than a hospital. It should have a dentist chair, an x-ray machine, an isolation ward, a counselor's room, emergency rooms, psycho uh, uh, physiotherapy rooms, a medical dressing room, and of course, isolation wards and the various beds. At least I'm talking about a residential school. And the faculty, of course, should also do programs um, to, 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 to promote healthy living. The school wellness center is not something or some place where you solve medical issues. You also promote healthy living, like what to eat, what to exercise, uh, health and hygiene, cleanliness. In fact, in our school, the first aid squad was so popular that we even began an ambulance um, uh, emergency service for the town. This was much before the 108 ambulance services came into effect. I'm talking about the 1990s. And when people uh, needed an ambulance, they would phone the school. And we had a panel of teachers and, uh, and uh, a driver and a group of boys who would rush into town to, to take people to hospital. So we, we really were a very important, um, this was a very important, socially useful, productive work that we did. I think schools should also have mannequins where you practice CPR because to do CPR properly, you really need to practice it. Um, Hemlik is not called Hemlik because as you know, uh, <laughs> the German gentleman who invented it uh, didn't want his name to be uh, you know used without some sort of uh, money uh, you know transferred there, there was a bit of a um, uh, co copyright on the name so now it's called airway block uh, airway blockage removal and it's a very very life saving thing so i think with these uh, with these uh, with this start i i look forward to the to the views of the panel on this uh, both of these are life-saving um, uh, uh, 
maneuvers. I think most schools should train their children in these. Thank you very much, uh, Gagori. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for those wonderful, wonderful inputs. Thank you so very much. Uh, our next speaker on this topic, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Oshin Bhattacharya, CEO and founder at Nodespo. A chartered accountant by training, Oshin was a director at Jalot prior to starting Nodespo. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and the large. Oshin is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, a member of CPU Australia and CPU Ireland, and a member of SEMA UK. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. An avid reader and a passionate traveler, Oshin has keen interest in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is also a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He's also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategy. Archin, a very, very good evening. And over to you, please. Good evening, everyone. Gauri, am I audible? Absolutely. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. Now, first aid, whenever we hear this term, first thing that comes to our mind is first assistance or support given to a sick person, a casualty, for any kind of injury or sudden illness. And of course, before the arrival of professionals, before an ambulance comes in or a qualified paramedic or a medical person arrives. So I think one thing is very important here that we make a very clear distinction that first aid is not about conclusive diagnosis or about giving medicines. What is important in this particular case is to take care of any kind of emergency so that people who need urgent care and transportation to the nearest healthcare facility are taken care of. And as we are all aware that children are highly vulnerable to injuries and accidents considering their active lifestyle, considering the fact that, you know, in their growing up years. Now, Usually, mostly these are minor bruises, etc. But sometimes it might result in more serious things like fracture, bleeding, maybe fainting, burn, or suffocation, drowning, electric shocks, which are all very dangerous. And also, in within even in the school campus, God forbid, a staff member may suffer sudden illness, maybe a sudden heart attack or breathing problem, anything which requires immediate first aid. And of course, the first thing that comes in is confidence. A first aider needs to be confident. Now, it's very normal, very natural to be scared, especially if you're talking, if you're talking about training children and expecting help from them. So being nervous or being scared is completely normal. But training and practicing skills, and especially with things like role plays, scenario planning, simulations. It can help school students to be extremely confident. And that confidence can actually be a differentiator between life and death. Now, the procedure for attending any emergency always remains the same. Of course, assessing the situation. Here again, a judgment is required, which needs training. Give you an understanding that safety first so that they are prudent enough to reach out for help, seeking help, taking universal precautions, providing first aid, of course, and very important to ensure transportation to the nearest healthcare facility. And of course, basic things like hygiene, etc. Be it washing hands or disposing rubbish carefully so that the infection doesn't spread. Now, when we talk about First aid and the concerned law in India, I think one particular guideline is very important to discuss. Indian Good Samaritan Protection Guideline, which legally means someone who renders aid in an emergency to an injured person on a purely voluntary basis. The Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways has published this guideline called Indian Good Samaritan and Bystanders Protection Guideline. 
in the Gazette of India in May 2015. And this guideline is to be followed by hospitals, police, and any other authority for the protection of good Samaritans. Now, any bystander will not be liable for any civil or criminal liability purely because he or she has volunteered to help. Even the disclosure of contact details is to be voluntary. So in case if there's a road accident and a bystander offers help, takes that person to the nearest hospital, this guideline has been brought in with an objective of protecting their interests so that people do not hesitate while helping their fellow citizens. Even the lack of response by a doctor in an emergency pertaining to road accidents shall constitute professional misconduct, especially where he or she is expected to provide care. Now, why this is important is if you look at the entire thing from a holistic perspective, what do we expect from a, a bystander with a conscience? The fact is that we are trying to create an ecosystem where his or her interests are protected. But equally important, if he or she is skilled enough, not only good intent, but at least a basic level of training, I think it can save a lot of lives. And that is where this particular topic is so important. Of course, a few universal precautions which are always there. I think uh, important to always check the scene, ensure safety first, a dialing emergency number for ambulance. So also equally important is to treat children to protect themselves from any kind of transmission, disease, infection, etc. Beat using preventive breathing barriers, personal protective equipment, PPEs, etc. Cover their own cuts, sores, wounds, using disposable gloves, washing hands properly. And of course, to handle the victim with care, especially if he or she has suffered a spinal or neck injury, not to move them or to shake them. I think if you look at the role of a first aider, we can always remember PACT, protect, assess, care and transport. The advantage of training children, of course, very important, it's a lifelong learning. And once they learn this hands-on, it always stays with them. And in any crossroad of life, when they face a situation like this, this is so useful to save lives. Second, I think learning also spreads as ambassadors amongst their families, extended families, friends, civil society, this learning spreads. Someone volunteering during an emergency situation will actually inspire a lot many other people to roll up their sleeves and come forward. And also the fact is, since children are more prone to injuries, it's really important that they get help from their immediate friends, etc., who are with them, maybe at the playground or till the time an adult arrives, at least basic health is available at hand. Research has proved that children can administer first aid. Of course, as going through two major researches, both were conducted among children from the age of 10 to 18. But even below that, at least basic things like hygiene or like basic protocols, etc. So I think it's a very important topic. And I look forward to hear the views of our esteemed panel, educators with decades of experience on this particular topic from a very practical perspective. I thank all of you for giving me a very patient here. Over to you, Gauri. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashwin, for your valuable input. Well, ladies and gentlemen, to discuss this topic, we have a wonderful panel lined up for you today. But before we start with the panel discussion, a little bit about us here at Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech platform that creates short videos pertaining to the school curriculum. This means that every topic from every subject of the school syllabus has been converted into a series of short videos that can be used in two different cases. One is when you as a teacher are starting out a topic in your classroom. You can play one of these videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. These videos are just six to ten minutes in duration. 
and take up very little of your class time while offering the right kind of material to students to generate curiosity and excitement. The second is when the student is studying at home months later, they have access to the same videos on their personal devices, be it a laptop or a smartphone. They can watch the videos over and over again until they get a very clear understanding of the topic that you had taught them. What I'm going to do now is play you a mashup of notebook videos so that you know what they exactly look like. Hello all. In today's video lesson, we are going to read a fantastically messy comedy. Have you ever met anyone who creates a clutter every step he or she takes? Charlie described how he had stumbled upon the third level of the Grand Central Station on one night the previous summer while he had been returning from his office late at night. Different animals have different organs for movement. We walk and move using our limbs. Kakaet pehle aadmi ko maar dete hain, phir uski talashi lete hain. लेखक और सुमति भिकमंगों के वेश में यात्रा कर रहे थे अतः वे जहाँ भी डाकुओं वाली स्थिति देखते अपनी टोपी उतार कर भीख मांगने लगते If you head over to our website www.notebook.school, you would find all such videos at your disposal. If you want to book in your school, please do get in touch with our sales team at sales at the red notebook.school. With that, it is now time to introduce the wonderful panelists that we have with us today. Dr. Rashmi Tyagi, ma'am, Principal Director, Asheville World School, Maharashtra. Ma'am holds a PhD in Chemistry from IIT Roorkee. is a BA gold medalist and holds an MA from Mumbai University. She taught chemistry at University of Mumbai and MA University Baroda. She worked yes. as principal in CBC schools and was trained as a CBC principal at IIM Bangalore. She has published various research papers in chemistry, environment science, rural mm -hmm. and urban farming, innovative technology, pedagogy, nanotechnology, biomarkers, etc. Yes. Yes. She has also been awarded for outstanding contribution to community in 2020 for innovation and excellence in rural education in 2020. TV Raman Education Award 2021, only to name a few. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here today, and always a privilege to have you back. Next, we have with us Dr. Rashmi Singh, Principal for the Briar International School, Badlapur, Maharashtra. Ma'am holds a master's degree in physics with BA and started her career. As A level and IGCSE faculty in Rims International School and Junior College in Juhu, she was shortlisted as a teacher exchange program. In the US, students have secured world toppers rank in the subject of physics under her guidance for A levels. She was a trainer in international curriculum and has headed the physics department of Purda International School located in Santa Cruz as well. Ma'am, a very very good evening and welcome back to the panel. We also have with us Sumali Devdan, ma'am, principal of Zone Girls School, Deradun, Uttarakhand. A result-oriented professional with over 35 years of diverse experience in various Indian and international schools, teaching history, English, music. A dedicated head of school for many years in Indian and international schools, with a strong work ethic to build lasting relationships with teachers, management, parents, customers, vendors, and the team. Ma'am is accustomed to working in nurturing environments. With the ability to mold people, children, and achieve stable growth of the school environment, she is a certified piano and music teacher from the Trinity College of Music, London, and has extensive international experience through working and traveling. Ma'am, a very very good evening and welcome to the panel. All my wonderful panelists, thank you so much for being here today, and would kindly ask the, all of you to uh, switch on your cameras. If I can first come to Rashmi Tagi, ma'am. Ma'am, your view on the topic, please. Namaskar, everyone, and welcome everybody who is present for this session. And as Gaguri and Achin sir and Barrett sir, all of them are the you know the part of the family, and they are inviting all the educators for such a you know. Uh, needed awareness and they are doing uh, this kind of you know awareness for the last two three years so i just congratulate them 
And secondly, I would like to welcome the educators today. I can see the women empowerment here and all these educators are really worth appreciating. Rashmi ji, she's a great educator from uh, Maharashtra, I should say. And uh, she's really handling the work which she's given of, you know, having a very good school and I should say chains of schools. So you have really brought these types of educators. And then from Dehradun, because I'm from Burki, so I'm going to welcome ma'am. Uh, she's from Dehradun and uh, she's really uh, working so much for the children. Am I right, Gaguri? Okay, so I'm really very much uh, honored to be with all of you, I should say. And the topic which you have chosen, it is the need of the hour. Because these kind of uh, things, the accidents happen, you know, so much when we are there, especially in the schools. And because today we are invited here, so mostly we'll speak of how to handle something which happens in the school, any accident. So for that, I would like to look back at the schools where I had worked and what kind of things were cropping up when the children are there in the school. So I'll talk of Ari Vidya Mandir and Bharti Vidya Peet. You know, especially Bharti, Bharti Vidya Peet, they were all boys. And it was so difficult to handle the boys. And during the, you know, recess time, always the fighting <laughs> used to take place between the students. And then always a little bit of cut or something and bleeding you know, any part of the body of a student. But what I want to say, that the students, when they used to get injured, then they never uh, used to feel scared or anything. But it was the duty of all of us, the teachers and the principal, to look after the, the injury of those children. So for that, we were well equipped and uh, we never used to get nervous, though it was very... Uh, much scaring to see the uh, lots of blood coming out out of the you know injury of the student but we used to handle it first in the school because in the school we are having the first aid kit and uh, you know we could call a doctor also but it was not required that we call a doctor and we used to do the first aid in the school we used to call the parents and then this is how we used to manage that and then I will uh, talk of, uh, you know, Bharti Vidya Peet. So there also these kinds of things were happening. And once it happened between two boys, so it was not, uh, you know, difficult to look after the injury, but it was very difficult that the we had to, you know, inform the police. So, I mean, we should be, the, be trained, the teachers, and the principles that we have to go to the police because in the hospital when we take the uh, you know the child then they always ask how it has happened so instead that you look after the you know uh, the child you have to talk to the you know these people in the hospital who are who are going to call the police and then they ask the question so that was more difficult for me uh, the MGM hospital was nearby. I had gone there and then uh, this uh, side of the, you know, uh, accident of the child or fighting, as I told you, mostly it happens like that to answer them. So we all of us should uh, keep these things in the school. And before we go to the hospital, we should, you know, talk among ourselves and with the parents that, okay, be prepared for this. Don't the parents should not fight of the two children. 
And then I will say that everybody is having the infirmary in the school, in CBSC schools, and maybe in ICSC and all other board school. And there we have got a you know place uh, and a bed also, and the glucose drip and other small things are already there. And we have got a doctor on call. We can call him, but before the doctor comes, it is our duty that we should look after the injured person. We should have a stretcher and we should have uh, even uh, if we have to take the children to the hospital, that arrangement also we should have. And uh, in case of fire, we should have a fire blanket also. And then we should train our children that how to handle uh, this type of incident and they should uh, get the mock drill also done if the uh, if the fire is taking place. And for that, in uh, one of my schools, uh, we have invited the fire brigade for our children. Uh, and there was a mock and they even show that if the fire breaks out, then how they are going to handle. So it is a show. So if you uh, have these kinds of programs in the school, mock things, then it is really good. And uh, in one of my school, you know, people from some social, uh, you know, uh, association, they came to our school and they have talked about that. And we called all the teachers and all the students to see that, that they were guiding them that how we are going to handle a patient like a injured person or maybe a child who has you know is having some kind of a disease that he stops breathing and then how you are going to give him the artificial respiration and uh, uh, when we talk of cpr for cpr also i think our sports teacher and other teachers should be trained that in case somebody is not, uh, I mean, is having heart attack or something like that, then they should be able to handle. So this is, I have summarized and then I would like to thank hear. You. So thank you thank very you. much for giving me this. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your input. Uh, moving on to Rashmi Singh, ma'am. Ma'am, if you can just deliberate uh, sharply on the topic. Ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. Rashmi Singh, ma'am, any uh, issues with the connectivity? I think. Hello, ma'am, are you there? Unfortunately, on my way. Okay, ma'am, we can uh, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can uh, right start speaking. Uh, yeah, I would begin with a news that has come today in the Times of India. In today's newspaper, if you see, there was a case uh, which is of uh, Virar, uh, a place Virar here in Mumbai. A child who was of age four years, uh, the parent, probably the mother parent had gone to drop the father parent to the nearest station. And uh, they believe that the child will wake up after she arrives home. But before she could reach, the child actually who was uh, stationed on fifth floor, I believe, she was uh, desperately looking for the parents as she didn't find them. And uh, through a window, she tried to climb out because she she thought that uh, there's no one at home and she was panicked. And uh, unfortunately, as she climbed the window, her leg slipped and she fell down. And as the parent came in, the parent after dropping the father parent, when she came in, she saw that there was a crowd gathered near her place and the child was in the pool of blood. And by the time that she was taken to the nearest hospital, she was declared dead. It is there in the newspaper today, highly sensitive to hear that. What I want to bring uh, the point here is, if you happen to be a person, the only person rather, or the first person to see such kind of accidents, Probably you are the only one who's a link between the victim and the needed emergency medical care. So I feel the most important point here is that people around, and when we talk about people around, of course, our students, 
we need to sensitize them about the issue that they shouldn't wait for anybody else or anything else they should act at that moment and when we say act i mean they should be aware of the needed medical emergency numbers for example the the ambulance nearest ambulance number the helpline for medical uh, uh, aid or uh, the fire alarm these are the basic uh, helpline numbers which i feel it should be in the tip of tongue of every student every student for uh, the piloting of it but however yes all of us should be aware of these numbers basically and the fact that if we don't act probably we are denying the person who is a victim of the opportunity to live again the opportunity to overcome uh, the mishap uh, probably the person has undergone and yes thereafter comes the other aspect uh, achin sir has beautifully summarized all of it but i would still like to highlight few of it there are three p's according to me which are very very important when it comes to practicing the first aid one of the p's being preserve life the other being prevention of the injuries and the third p is to promote the necessary actions or to to act on the necessary guidelines which probably may be the only guidelines uh, that could help the victim so here when i talk about preserving the life it is very important for all of us to understand the person who has undergone such trauma the person is actually in a state of anxiety in a state of helplessness he probably in a state of absolutely uh, you know a disturbed state of mind so it is it is the person who probably knows to practice this first aid the person should know to comfort the victim the person should at least know of how to get out of uh, i mean how to get that person the victim out of uh, the kind of discomfort probably by doing anything which is required just for an example i think ma'am rashmi tami tagi ma'am was talking about giving the required pcr so we should know the person who is practicing this should know it is 12 pcr to be given in one minute which means every 5 second the pcr needs to be given to the per person who's undergone some heart stroke or any kind of uh, you know uh, uh, problem uh, probably the heart attack and moreover we should keep talking with the person we should keep the person the the effort should be to keep the person in the conscious state and of course the last one reaching to the required helpline reaching to the required medical aid uh, facility probably or ambulance facility so that the person uh, you know has some kind of uh, connectivity with the person providing the first aid okay some things are being done for me i am going to be out of this very soon so i feel such kind of sensitization is needed in all of us and very beautifully brought up by i think achim sir stating that now very recently i think past uh, two or three years back uh, this was actually helped by the constitution by the legislature that any person who probably would be the first person to help the victim would be out of any kind of legal liability mm. so that is a great initiative by our legislatures but i think more than that i feel the issue of sensitizing people to act not just watch or not just make a video or not just wait for somebody else to come in we should be the first one to act as much as we know and of course uh, trying to reach out to the professionals like the medical helpline or the ambulance at the earliest so with this i think i tried giving uh, a little insight of what i could understand thank you gagori thank you very much thank you so much ma'am absolute pleasure to listen to you always thank you so much for your valuable inputs thank you ma'am uh, moving you. on to uh, moving on to sumali ma'am sumali devgan ma'am ma'am a very good evening welcome to the panel if you can find this wish on your camera please hi kaguri good evening good, good evening, evening to everyone everyone here good evening ma'am good evening ma'am Ma'am, uh, we wanted to uh, hear a little bit about uh, the basic first aid and CPR skills, and how is uh, that being approached in your school in particular, ma'am? Right. So, um, I will just almost have the same words as Mr. Philip Barrett had because we 
are mostly in residential schools. And residential schools, I think, do differ a little bit from the day schools, right? Having worked in both, so I can see the difference. So in, in our school here, we do have, of course, a 12-bedded infirmary, a little hospital. We have the doctor on call. We have uh, trained nurses, right? And also, it's very important that the teachers should know the basic rules, the basic principles of first aid. CPR, right? And like Mr. Bharat earlier said that, yes, we have had uh, groups like St. John's Ambulance come and train the teachers. Uh, our children also, before they go on their midterm treks, they are told about the basic principles of first aid, you know. And being in a residential school, you know, I think teachers are better prepared to handle, uh, you know, injuries, illnesses and all, because the children are with us almost 24-7 most of the teachers. So yes, definitely residential teachers are better prepared to handle cases. And it's a kind of a daily thing. You know, we have games in the evening. So it's not like day schools where children go home at 1.30 or 2 and then the parents take over. Here, the teachers have to be alert all time. You know, we have injuries in games time. We have bee stings, which can be pretty bad also in, in campuses like ours. So in our school, definitely we are very careful, we are alert, we do train our teachers in the basic first aid. We also have um, training by the fire department at regular intervals. It's not once in five years or something, it's a regular program. And we also carry out mock drills regularly. So, you know, so whether it's for fire drills or for earthquake drills, yes, we have them regular. Um, and so children are also alert, you know. And uh, I think the idea is, see, we are not trained doctors or medical people. The idea is to make the child who, who is injured or sick, make them comfortable, make them safe. And we should know the basic principles. If a child has a fracture in the arm or leg, we should know how, in what position to keep the child, right? Till we take the child to the specialist. So that so that's why it's important for all teachers to be trained, have the basic training in schools. So they know how to handle and what to do, what position the child has to be kept, you know, and where to put the pressure if there is an open wound or some bleeding has taken place. So, yeah, so yes, definitely I do uh, feel exactly what Mr. Barrett had said earlier, residential schools, we are faced with it continuously. It's, it's an everyday. So the other day in our school, we had an inter-house skating competition and there were lots of injuries, you know, because kids taking the turn, they fell. A couple of them had, you know, hairline fractures on their arms. So, you know, these things happen, but uh, we are pretty well prepared to handle them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your deliberation. We had a wonderful discussion on basic first aid and CPR skills today. I uh, wanted to thank all my panelists for their inputs and uh, gracing the platform. Absolutely wonderful topic, and uh, thank you all so much for your input. Calling back, Ashin, for the vote of thanks. Yeah, Gauri, I think uh, really wonderful deliberation. But sir, thank you as always for, uh, you know, for for your perspective. I think uh, very nicely you explained. Uh, the entire responsibility of residential school, the perspective, and also I think a wonderful initiative, both in terms of uh, the ambulance service, really very touching, very responsible, I think very inspirational, and also very nicely extend the entire uh, concept of CPR, and of course, you know, it can really, really, really come in very handy and save lives. Dr. Rashmi Tyagi, uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being a part of uh, the panel. In fact, uh, whenever we, you know, whenever we are fortunate to have you in the panel, it's always, we, we always benefited by your wisdom, by your practical experience of so many years, of decades. So I think uh, very nicely you explained the concept of uh, first aid, the importance of practical examples, and also the situation at you know, the ground level, be it in terms of hospitals, the entire ecosystem of parents coming in, at times incidents like that, unfortunate incidents, the police getting involved. But yes, these are ground realities. So I think, uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for, for bringing this. Uh, Prashmi Singh, ma'am, 
thank you so much. I think, uh, first of all, a very unfortunate incident. Uh, really very unfortunate and very touching incident. I think as, as parents, as adults, all of us need to be careful what, what you just shared with us today's incident. And I think uh, you, you made a very, very uh, nice point, pertinent point that the uh, anybody coming in for first aid as a link between victim and emergency medical care. And the other point that you made, I completely agree, I couldn't agree more, that to sensitize children not to wait. That, okay, if he or she is the first person to come forward, to have the courage, the conviction to, to come forward, All right? And of course, that's where training comes in handy and things like role plays, simulations will, will build that confidence. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Sumali Devan, ma'am, uh, thank you. I think, uh, again, very nicely explained the concept of residential school, the fact that 24 by 7 responsibility with so much happening. And of course, uh, the importance of training that you brought in, you know, we, we couldn't agree more. So overall, great session. And I'm sure members of the esteemed audience also benefited uh, from this. We look forward to your continued support in the sessions to come. Thank you. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sachin. Thank you, everyone. Sachin, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Gagori.